some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that what about the Chicago incident? She's qualified for services. We left. More of a community. We're trying to back over. doing in autism. Her writing has been called achingly beautiful, a marvel of imagination. Lisa C. is a best-selling author and is considered one of the leading authorities on Chinese culture. In her first book, On Gold Mountain, The 100-Year Odyssey of My Chinese-American Family, C. traced the journey of her great-grandfather, Fong C., who was godfather of the Los Angeles Chinatown. Her passion for lost or forgotten stories has been the source for such acclaimed novels as Snowflower and the Secret Fan and Shanghai Girls among others. Her extensive research has led her to areas of China so remote she was said to be the second foreigner ever to visit. Here's our conversation with Lisa C. Lisa C., welcome to the conversation. I'm happy to be here. I want to start with On Golden Mountain. That's your 1995 autobiography, which really seems to be the book that started everything. Mm -hmm. um, you'd been writing for uh, Publishers Weekly for a number of years. Right. Tell us how you came to write your family's journey, really, 100-year odyssey from China to the U.S. Actually, people had been approaching my family for years and years and years, 100 years, to write a book or a magazine article or even a film script, and always my family had said no. And I think it was a combination of things. I think they had a lot of shame and embarrassment on one hand, because a lot of what my family did was either you know, borderline illegal or full on out there illegal. And then they, on the other side, they had a kind of an arrogance of, oh, why should we participate in your project? And things had stayed that way for about 100 years. And then someone approached me to do, an, um, had wanted to include our family in a book she was doing on prominent Chinese American families. And I asked my great aunt if she would participate. And as always, she said, oh no, we don't participate in things like that. And the book came out two years later. I gave it to my great aunt on her 80th birthday. And she called the next day and she said, you know, I realize I made a mistake. Why don't you come over? I want to tell you some stories. And that first day, I heard things I'd never heard before, just never heard before. My great-grandfather, I'd always thought, had had two wives. In fact, he had four. <laughs> and then, it kind of in passing, she mentioned a kidnapping. And I'd never heard about the kidnapping. And it took another two years to get the story of the kidnapping. So that's how it started, by actually a series of no's. And then, you know, I was into it. It would be an amazing story if it were fiction, oh, and, yes. and yet it's true. Yes, well, you know what they say, real life <laughs> is stranger than fiction, and that is true. My my um, great-great-grandfather came to this country to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. He was a bit of a womanizer and a gambler, and so he didn't send money home back to his own family, which meant that his wife, my great-great-grandmother, used to carry people on her back mm from village to village to, to, make money. to make money. And finally, people took pity on her and lent my great-grandfather, who was 14 years old, the money to come by himself to the Gold Mountain, what the Chinese called the United States. Now, you actually went back to your ancestral village oh, yes. in 1991. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that like for you? It was an incredible thing. You know, I, well, in so many ways. You know, I think for anyone who goes back to the home country, wherever it is, you have this sense of there but for the grace of God. You know, that because everyone in that village today, still 300 people, you know, just I'm related to all of them. It would have been so easy for my part of the family to have stayed there and never gotten out. And so there was that aspect to it, which I think everybody feels. But for me, the thing that was so extraordinary was how I could see things in our family today that I didn't always understand that traced right back to that village and village life. So when I was growing up, my grandparents and all my aunts and uncles had a very particular kind of garden. It had bamboo and cymbidiums and bodai trees, and they were very lush and very tropical, very, you know, just wonderful to be in, except for one thing. They, they were filled with all of this junk, um, <laughs> used electrical conduit picked up by the side of the road, old motors picked up by the side of the road, f empty five-gallon soy sauce containers just kept and kind of rusting out there. 
because they always picked up anything that they they thought they might, might come useful. in handy someday. Well, I thought that was wonderful until I, you know, went to kindergarten and I started going to people's houses and seeing lawns and roses and I thought, oh, those people are weird, you know, <laughs> and then I got a little older and I thought, no, those people are the regular people and my family is weird. Until that first time I went into China on the train and outside, and this was just a day trip from Hong Kong to, Gu to Guangzhou and the train crosses over the border and right outside the window were the houses of the poorest of the poor and they were built right up to the railroad tracks and looking down into these little courtyard gardens were the gardens that I'd grown up with and so here we were you know a hundred years later and we still we looked completely different some of us we could have lost our Chinese we um, were well educated you know all of these things that were different and yet there was a kind of a visual aesthetic of, you know, the tr that, that sort of tropical feel, but also the way that you live, that frugality that had stayed with the family all the way to today. One of the things you say in your book is that the Chinatowns of L.A. And, and, and New York and China City, which many people probably have never even heard of, the interesting thing about them is that they stayed the same while China was right. evolving. Exactly. The immigrants who went and made up places like Chinatown kept these uh, things like the garden right. that you just mentioned. Yes, that's absolutely true because in those early days, especially in the West, you could not live outside of Chinatown. You know, California had miscegenation laws, they had land laws, they, so you couldn't live outside of Chinatown until 1948 in California. In fact, your parents were one of the first people in, in your entire in, family who married be, legally. Legally, yes. Everyone else either went to Mexico or to get married or my great-grandparents, they went to a lawyer who drew up a contract between two people as though they were forming a partnership. So my parents, yes, were the, only the second out of our whole family to be married legally in the United States. But anyway, the, the thing is, is when you couldn't work outside of Chinatown, you couldn't live outside, you couldn't go to school outside, what do you hold on to? You hold on to your traditions and your culture. But in fact, in the home country, you know, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, traditions and culture were evolving and changing. Now, people look at you, you're one-eighth Chinese, mm -hmm. you have reddish hair and freckles, and, and there's not much about you no. that looks Chinese, <laughs> although you say if you're next to cousins, you can yes. see some, some family resemblance. Um, but you say in your heart you're Chinese. What do you mean by that? Well, I just think that, you know, here's how I always think of it. When I was growing up, I, you know, I have about 400 relatives in Los Angeles. There are about a dozen that look like me. The majority are still full Chinese and in this spectrum in between. And so how do we identify ourselves? It's by the people we see around us. They're our mirror. And so what I saw around me were Chinese faces. That's what I thought I was. I guess I was a little deluded when I looked in the mirror. You know, I didn't see what was actually there. But that's, that's I think, part of it is that it, was, it wasn't something that was a choice, it was just something that was, because that was what was around me. Did you grow up looking in the mirror wanting to look more Chinese than you did? I thought I was Chinese. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't think, I didn't really think that I looked different. I don't know how to explain it. I just, I, I was deluded. But I mean, I didn't think that I, I just didn't think that I looked different. And but, it wasn't until I was working on On Gold Mountain actually, that I would be interviewing a, a relative and they would say, oh, you know, you should go talk to so-and-so, you know, he's Caucasian like you, and like they were letting me in on something. <laughs> and I had never realized that in my own family, people saw me as different. And I think that that is really very much at the heart of my writing, that I, I feel very comfortable and at home in Chinatown. That's what I know. And yet, no matter what, I'm never going to be fully accepted there. When I go to China, it's like a larger version of Chinatown. I understand it, I get it, and yet, because of how I look, I'll never be completely accepted there. 
I can travel out around the country and come to a place like this and I might look like I absolutely belong, but sometimes there are things I don't get. I just don't get, I just, it's like it's very foreign to me. And so that sense of not being completely here and not being completely there and always trying to sort of ne ne negotiate. negotiate and navigate through mm -hmm. life, I think that that has really helped my writing because I'm always, in the, in the way that I'm trying to explain to myself what I know or what I don't know, I think that also helps readers because what they know or they don't know about the Chinese culture or how they can think about family or things like that yes. in another culture, they can, they're, they, I think they're coming from that same place that I'm actually coming from. Well, speaking of what they don't know, you learned volumes. You, you are a self-described research fiend. You have literally been to all of the places that you write about. For good in and your bad. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, lots of writers, especially writers who have written as many books as you are, have, um, they send a research team out to do the kinds of things you do. What was it like, literally, traveling in the footsteps, in a way, wearing the clothes of your ancestors? It's an incredible, I mean, I just, I think there, again, it goes back to there, but for the grace of God. It, when you see, when, for me, when I saw that village where my family was from, uh, it was just, I don't know, I, I really, I don't know how to describe it because part of it was, I'm so glad I, my family got out, but part of it was this deep understanding suddenly of my family and particularly of my great grandfather that people had always said, oh, he rules us with an iron fist. He's so stingy. In fact, he sent so much money back to the village that when I was there, they would say, oh, you know, he built that school and he built that road and those are the houses he built for the people in the village, that he, that he really was a benefactor there. And so that way that he had ruled the family with a iron fist, that he was so stingy in, in Los Angeles, was kind of this beneficence there. And so that made me see him in a completely different way because I think the family in Los Angeles had a lot of hard feelings actually about that. And so there's that. But the other thing that happens when you actually go to a place, there are the smells. I mean, it's not just what you see. It's the smell. It's the feel of the air on your skin. And you describe all of those. Yeah. I mean, I do think that those five senses are really important in writing. And finally, you never know what you're going to come across. And you never know what you're going to see that can change things completely or just change things in a different way. So there was, uh, for example, for Snowflower and the Secret Fan. I went to uh, Jianyang County, it's in southwestern Hunan province. I was told I was only the second foreigner ever to go there. By my count, I was actually the fifth, but only the second Caucasian looking foreigner. It was way out there. And let's just say this, I'm not a camper, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I like things like hot water and running water uh -huh. and, you know, sheets and uh -huh. things like that. It was it was a tough, tough trip. I had to eat what they gave me, you know? And, and so, I read about some of yeah. what you ate, yeah. which I won't repeat. Right. <laughs> exactly. Just think about the worst kinds of things you'd want to eat. I ate them. <laughs> so they're aspects of that kind of trip that are just physically hard and, and you know being out there in the middle of nowhere you, you know I just kept thinking to myself don't have appendicitis don't fall and break your ankle or something like that you know because you're out there so the thing is while I was there I got to meet the oldest living new shoe writer this was the these the women the, who language. used this secret writing system she was 96 I think when I met her um, she died three months later, so I just felt so fortunate. I mean, it, to me, it was a kind of a life-changing experience to have met her. Uh, and, you know, she had bound feet. She could no longer make bound foot shoes because her hands were so crippled by arthritis. Um, but, and so she wore these, these um, child-sized kung fu slippers with Kleenex stuffed in the toes. And she talked to me about the life she had before her feet were bound, what it was like to have her feet bound, what it was like to go into an arranged marriage, what it was like to be part of a sworn sisterhood, what, what this secret language had meant to her. Well, you can't get that out of a book. 
you just can't. And she even sat there with her granddaughter. And even though she couldn't make these things herself, she had her daughter showing me how to make bound foot shoes and how to make wedding quilts. And you're with a translator. And I was with a translator, but I could understand <laughs> so every so many words. <laughs> but the thing is, I and actually in the first draft of Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I had a whole scene where they're making bound foot shoes, making wedding quilts, and all of that eventually got left by the wayside. But I know how to do it now. And so there are other books that I can always come back to and, oh, if somebody needs to make a wedding quilt, I'll know how to do it. Well, it's interesting because in all of your books, Peony and Love, Shanghai Girls, which is your most recent book, uh, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, there are elements that I read in On Gold Mountain oh, yes. that figure into mm -hmm. your fiction. Mm -hmm. um, what, a, what a wealth of information your own family has provided in that way. Talk about some of the things that you discovered. Um, for instance, at Angel Island, uh, which was the, the West Coast Ellis Island, right. um, about your own family that was just so shocking or so... Uh, just such an incredible nugget that mm -hmm. you said this has got to be part of right. one of my stories. Well, with On Gold Mountain, I had written, oh, I don't know, I was about 350 pages into the book when someone said, have you thought about going to the National Archives? I, no, of course I hadn't, because that's where they have the Constitution, you know, it just never occurred to me. And so there, there are these holding facilities around the country. One of them is in San Francisco. And I wrote to them and they, they called me back a couple of days later and they said, you'd better come up here. We have found more on your family than any other family so far. And yet you say your family was ordinary. The C family was ordinary. Yes, but, they sounded but, extraordinary to me but to read about my great-grandfather, he was many things, but he was a legitimate merchant. And so as a merchant, he would travel to China and come back in. Every time he left, that meant a whole series of interviews. Every time he came back, it was a whole series of interviews and interrogations. And these weren't just with him. It was with the tombstone maker, the policeman on the beat, the man who did hauling. There was another man who was a... Um, former soldier of fortune and they would the government the in the there was department of labor then they would come out and they would interview people who knew him and and knew whoever else was traveling and all of these files are linked together so it wasn't just my great grandfather it was also my great great uncle and these different wives my aunts my uncles all of these people every time they left the country every time they came back in they they were in, interrogated so to me, one of the incredible things, so here I'd written 350 pages, and they roll out this cart, just loaded down over 500 pages of interrogations, boarding passes, health certificates, um, photographs, I don't know if I said that, well, uh, but what? all of this stuff on this cart. And they give me white gloves to look at it. And I open it up, one of the files, and it happened to be 1901, and there was my great-grandfather speaking on the page. Well, you know, he died when I was two. So all I had in the book up to that point was things that people said he said, you know, and, and so you don't know, it's been 50 years or whatever, the, the, how that gets changed or shifted. But here I actually had what he said. Now, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have to throw out everything. In fact, those files just confirmed so much of what I already had because my family was basically illiterate. So everything was handed down in this oral way and because you always had to be careful with the inspectors because they were coming in all the time. There, was, there were set stories that people needed to memorize, you know. So there they were and you could track in these files over many years how the lie would shift <laughs> or how, you know, they'd let's try this. There was one point when my great grandfather was trying to bring in paper sons. It didn't work. It just didn't work for him. And we should explain what paper sons yes. are. Right. So um, Chinese could not become citizens. They were not allowed into the country. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which had barred the immigration of all Chinese immigrants to the United States, except for four categories, merchants, diplomats, students, and ministers. And of those four, there was only one you could fake, being a merchant. 
my great-grandfather was a legitimate merchant. But he had a partnership list. He didn't have any actual partners, but he had this partnership list in which every six months there would be anywhere from eight to a dozen new names. And he would turn this into the government every six months. And these were merchants on paper, people who had paid him anywhere from 50 to $500 to be on that list. And in that way, he was able to bring in a lot of people as paper merchants. Now, the paper sons were different. In 1906, there was the earthquake and fire in San Francisco. All Suddenly, the records were destroyed. All of the records were destroyed. People could say, I was born here, therefore American citizens by birth. Well, no one could prove them right, no one could prove them wrong. So now people who could have that status would travel back to China. They would claim that their wife had had a baby. They would get another piece of paper. They could sell that piece of paper to a friend, a neighbor, a total stranger, who would then travel to this country as a paper son. This was so secretive that there were some young men who grew up with families that were not their families and always oh. wondered why they were treated differently yes. because yes. they weren't biological right. children. In some families it was very open. You know, this very, oh, you know, let's have Thanksgiving dinner. We're all Fongs, but you're an Eng. But, you know, we, you're actually, you know, we call you a Fong, but you're actually an Eng or a Wong or a whatever. So the, some families very open and kind of teased you know, a lot of open teasing and bantering about it. But in other families, it's, it's been kept such a secret that I meet people all the time or they write to me all the time about how they didn't know that their father was a paper son until after he died and they were going through the papers. Because of fear. Be because of the fear, that that fear has lingered all the way to today in some families. Fear that you would be deported. Right, that because you're not actually a citizen, you don't know what's going to happen, that you could be deported. Now, the interesting thing about your family is you come from a long line of writers, actually, and, mm -hmm. and you, were, you mentioned a moment ago that, that a lot of your relatives were illiterate. Your mother, Carolyn C., uh, who was married to your father for just a short time, just right. five years, um, is a writer uh, of note. Um, uh, your grandfather was actually a writer. Your sister writes. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't grow up wanting to be a writer. No, I didn't. You know, as you said, my mother's a writer. My mother's father is a writer. This is the other side of the family. My mother's father, my that grandfather, he was an old Texas newspaper man. And I think... You know, he always wanted to write the great American novel and never really got around to it. He had a fondness also for kind of women. Um, <laughs> was married five times when he was in his late 60s. His new wife had a brand new baby. Uh, he was very depressed. And we went down to visit. My mom and I, I was about 10, I guess. And my mom was a single mother. And there was a period back, and this is in the 70s, somewhere in there, that the way she helped to support us was by testifying in pornography trials as an expert witness. And she, you know, she's a PhD in English, so she would say, oh, yes, this scene is just like out of Shakespeare. Not really, but you know, <laughs> she, she would say that. So she had this stack of books. My grandfather was very depressed, and he picked one up, and he was flipping through it, and he said, oh, you know, I could do better than this. And he went down to the back bedroom and he came out two weeks later with his first hardcore pornographic novel, which was then published. And then he went on to write between then and when he died 75 hardcore pornographic novels, all of which were published. Um, what did you make of all this? I, it made me think, <laughs> I don't want to be a writer. That's what it made me think. That's what it, I mean, that's really what it made me think. I don't think this is the thing for me. And, uh, you know, I watched my mom from the, her very first article through all of her books. And in those early years, as it is for everyone, it's very hard, you know, and there's a lot of rejection and a lot of criticism, and those things are hard to take. And so I just didn't want to be a writer. Now, when I was 20, I took two years off from college. I was bumming around Europe, and I kept thinking that there are certain things I know about myself. I don't want to get married. I don't want to have children. I don't want to live, uh, be a writer, and I always want to live out You've of a suitcase. You've done all of those things. Yes, I have. <laughs> so, Everyone. You know, but I was, I was living in Greece, and I just kept thinking, how will I be able to support myself? And one morning I woke up, and it was like, oh, a light bulb. You know, I could be a writer. And so when I came back to Los Angeles, within the first 48 hours, I had my first two magazine assignments. 
and yes, I'm a writer, so it just goes to show I, you know, didn't know myself very well. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about the Chinese and what most people don't know is that there were actually the first women writers maybe in the world from China and an absolutely rich history mm -hmm. of women writers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were the first, but they, you know, China does have 5,000 years of history and women were writing all along and it's been collected and saved and preserved. I actually have a book that was published by Harvard University Press. It, it's about the size of a phone book of 5,000 years of, of women's writing in China. It's just an extraordinary, heavy, heavy document, bu book. And so um, one of the, these groups was in the mid-17th century in the Yangtze Delta. There were more women writers who were being published than all together in the rest of the world at that time. Well, there weren't very many and the rest of the world at that time. I think we'd be hard pressed to come up with the names of even five. But in this one area, there were over a thousand women writers who were being published, who were traveling around the country in the 17th century version of book tours, who were supporting their families with their writing. A lot of that writing has survived to today. It's, it's published, you know, translated into English, and it's pretty extraordinary. And these kinds of stories, I was particularly interested in a, in a kind of a subgroup of those women, what were called the lovesick maidens, these women who loved this opera, the Peony Pavilion, and when they read it, they would catch cases of lovesickness, like the main character in the opera, and then waste away and die. And literally. Literally. And as they were dying, they would write these poems and stories that their families would publish after they died. And so there, there, was, um, three, there were three women, all married to the same man, all uh, lovesick maidens. They all died. They all worked on one book together, one right after the other, which was then published. And it was the first book of its kind to have been written and published anywhere in the world by women. And so for me, that, that was the inspiration for Peony in Love. I had a, there was something I wanted to say, but it kind of went right out of my <laughs> head. But I, I think that, um, to me, what's so interesting about them and some of these other stories that I've written, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, with that secret language, is that we're often told, you know, there were no women writers, no women artists, no women historians, no women chefs. I mean, you could fill in the blank there, that there were no women doing these things. Well, of course there were. It's just so much of what they did was lost, forgotten, deliberately covered up. And so to me, when I am writing these books, that's whether it's about my own family or with the Peony Pavilion and the Lovesick Maidens or with um, Shanghai Girls and what it was like for the beautiful girls and it, living in China City or coming through Angel Island as a woman, that, that these are things that really have, it's not the, You've given them legs. Yeah, well, I guess did you, that's did, it. did you feel you had a responsibility to tell these stories? Because one of the themes that certainly is weaved throughout all of your work is that women want to be heard. And so many mm -hmm. of the women that you write about, they are cloistered. They are literally, in, in many ways, mm -hmm. imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And the, bi the bound feet is another form another of imprisonment. imprisonment. Right. I think that the, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, there's just no question that I've wanted to go back and find these voices. They're one of those uh, writers, the uh, lovesick maidens, she s wrote something that something, it goes something like this. Why is it that women in the past that um, they're, their voices have disappeared like leaves on the wind. And, uh, you know, why can't we go, and, and then it goes on, it's like, why can't we preserve them? Why can't we save them? Well, she was writing that 300 years ago. That has really stuck with me. And I... I and you were holding the actual paper she wrote yes, that on. Yes, That's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, to me, there's something very powerful about these voices because of what these women had to go through to have their stories told. People who read your stories cry. I mean, they are breathtakingly <laughs> yes. sad. And so I'm wondering I'm for you. <laughs> I'm laughing. Yes, they do. <laughs> but I'm wondering for you, 
for for you to move me on the page, I can't even imagine what it's like for you writing it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's so funny people say that. Oh, I cried, I cried, and I just think, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but when I'm writing, it's uh, it, there are two things I think. One is I don't. I'm not terribly emotional in the writing of it. It's actually more You're a in, journalist. The ed, in the yeah. editing. Or if I have to read it out loud, like I, when I do events, I don't do readings because I can't. It's, too, it's often too sad for me to read out loud, but I can write it. Those, going back to those same women writers in the 17th century, one of the things they believed, and, and they wrote about this a lot, was that you have to cut to the bone to write. This was their belief, that you have to cut to the bone. And I think that there's an element of truth in that. You know, I don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, goody, you know, I get to kill off beautiful moon or someone's going to lose their baby or there's going to be this terrible rape or someone's going to commit suicide. I don't think that and I certainly don't feel it as I'm writing it. It's very hard and it is going to this very uh, deep, dark, dark, sad place, hard place. And a lot of it isn't just pure sadness. It's about remorse and guilt and atonement and and those kinds of emotions and those aren't easy places to go to but I feel I don't know I just feel if I can get to that place and there's something that's very true um, someone the other day in a in a book event in Torrance California asked me you know why why did I have the rape in Shanghai Girls why is that rape there and and you know why does it have to be so brutal well I'm sorry Rape's it's not brutal. a it's not a picnic you're going on and I think sometimes what happens in television and movies and in books is something terrible happens but there's no consequence I that's not my experience of life. Something terrible happens and there's this concept, this, this trickle down that happens in, in, in your family. It happens out even sometimes to your friends, to where you work. Um, if you lose a parent or you lose a child, these are, these are terrible things that you don't just wake up the next day and think, okay, I'm going to go get my hair cut. You although know, although know, in just... Shanghai girls, Pearl and May might step off the curb to get into a rickshaw and step over a dead baby. Yes, that's right. Because they have a kind of callousness in some ways. And certainly one of the things I learned from interviewing my own family, so these were true things that happened to people, is that they did have a kind of matter-of-fact way that they would talk about some of these really just so sad and tragic things that had happened. Um, there were three of the children were kid, well, actually, yeah, three were kidnapped. One baby died, and what and 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 what had happened in that kidnapping, or when other. Kidnapped you know, for ransom. Kidnapped for ransom. But there are other, you know, it's a big family. A lot of children died in, in my family, as, as they did in families around the world at that time, when you, before you had antibiotics and all of that stuff. And so I think there's a part where you're just trying to get through. You know, life is so hard. You're so poor. You're so cut off from the outside world or whatever is happening and this isn't just Chinese this is for anyone right that you're just trying to survive and get through right you're just trying and so there's a part where you you know I think flying across the country and you look down and you think all those pioneers who came west and those big families and how many survived and how hard it had to have been but you had to have a kind of a grit to get across where you, you, you couldn't allow yourself the luxury of great emotion. But those people, they stayed in, the ones who die, they stay in your family. They stay there like shadows. And so you can have that kind of, I'm being tough here, but that doesn't mean you haven't been affected. And it doesn't mean that people don't miss you or that they don't think of you or they don't think, what if, if only I had done something different. And I, I think that that's something that we all live with 
today, you know, that we all of us, um, you know, we all lose people. And, and you know, if, if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to happen. You know, we all lose people. And so how do we move forward? And, and how do we do that? Well, well speaking of, of losing people, I think as recently as 1998, 100 million females are missing from the planet, females who have been the victims of infanticide or abortion. And China tops that list, I think, oh, yes. uh, 30, 30 Point five million or something back in 1998. Well, yeah, but I think today it's a hundred million in China. China. And I, you talked a moment ago about unintended consequences. And as I read that number, I start to think, might the unintended consequence be that women are more valued? Well, it has been actually in China, it, um, in in weird ways. Um, I mean, in the obvious ways too. The obvious ways you have for every year that the one-child policy has been in effect, there's a million fewer girls. That means there are a million fewer women to marry. So there's this real shortage of women to marry. This has resulted in a lot of human trafficking, um, kidnapping girls, from young women countries. from other, from small villages, but also raids into North Korea to bring young women in, and other kinds of things like that, which are horrific. terrible, mm -hmm. horrific. Um, but they've also now have an economic value that they didn't have before because they're going out, they're working, they go, they leave their home villages, they go to big cities where they work in big factories and in these contracts and, and save up money for a couple of years. Often they go back to their village, often they don't. And so, you know, there's this, this, the other thing that's sort of happening in China right now is that it's the greatest human migration in the history of the world is happening there as people leave these villages, you know, 1.3 billion people, as people leave their villages and go to cities trying to find a better life. Why do you think the stories about the women in your books appeal at such a level to not just Americans, um, but, but women all over the world? Well, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about, about those sad things that happen. Um, you know, I think as women, we share in certain kinds of experiences. We're daughters. We um, fall in love. You know, we have children. We watch them grow up. We become grandparents. We often become widows first. Um, you know, we lose our husbands or our significant others first. And so there are certain things that we share. And, and the emotions that are attached to those relationships or those roles, I guess, those are universal. And I, uh, and I, I guess I, I think that that's what, what women connect to, is they think not only what would I do if I was in that situation? What would I do if I was one of those women in Snowflower and the Secret Fan from, from age five when you have your feet bound until you die living in one room? with one window your whole life. How would I survive it? How would I have gotten through it? Through friendship, through a need to communicate, through living sometimes as Snowflower does, you know, in this kind of imaginative Fantasy. world. Um, and I think people connect, you know, that women connect to that. But, but more than anything, I think it's these relationships, um, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, um, sisters, friends, friends more than anything, I think, um, because that f friend, female friendship is unlike any other relationship that we have in life. You know, you will tell a friend something that you won't tell your husband or your daughter or your mother, and it's a particular kind of intimacy. But that, that kind of intimacy, that leaves you open to a lot of terrible things too. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but there can be this dark side. Yeah, and I guess that's what it is. I'm talking around it and coming back, but I often will write about the dark shadow side of, of female relationships and emotions. You're very close with your mother. Um, mm -hmm. You were raised for a time um, in a remote cabin in, uh, in California. Mm -hmm. um, 
she was kind of a, a hippie and, and trying to get on her feet as a, as a writer. She wasn't kind of, she just was. <laughs> <laughs> um, although she was also an English professor right. and, and she taught you how to write. Um, she said something once that I thought was really interesting that although you kind of have the same writing discipline, uh, you're as different as, as Eggs Benedict and meringue pie. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're both made of eggs and they're right. both yellow, but, but you're very, very different. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with your mother because I read that you call each other every day to oh, yeah. um, provide support for whatever writing project yeah. you're on. Yeah, I mean, we talk to each other every day no matter what. Um, we don't always talk about writing. But, you know, my mom and I have, a, or at least I followed her example, the exact same um, uh, way, what do you, what do you call it? Um, Dis writing discipline. discipline. Thank you, discipline. <laughs> she believes a thousand words a day. I do a thousand words a day. She says, you know, a one, one uh, charming note. Well, I either do a charming written note or I send an awful lot of email. I like to think I'm charming, that way too. <laughs> um, but, but that you have to balance both of these things, the actual writing and the creativity and being disciplined about it, but also that you, it is a business. And so I think that's what she means when she says a thousand words a day in one charming note. And I follow that completely. I believe in it. I know it works it, and, and it's um, been really very freeing. You know, a thousand words, that's only four typed pages. And if every I, day. Every day. And so when I'm writing, when I'm actually writing. So when I'm on a book tour, I'm not doing that. But, you know, at the end of the week, that means you have a chapter. At the end of two weeks, you've got two chapters. So if you just have that discipline, you're going to get it done. And that, you know, there are always things that would be more fun to do. You know, always washing dishes is often <laughs> more fun to do than, than do you, you know sitting down to write. I mean, it's not it's not something. But you can't wait. Oh, this is what the point is. You can't wait for it. Oh, that moment of inspiration, because it it might take three months to come. So you have to just sit and work, and you you find it in the day. And, and sometimes, in this way, you don't have a writer's block. You don't right. allow yourself you don't a writer's allow it. block. And sometimes I'll be writing and I'll just think, oh, this sucks. You know, this is really bad, but I'm getting my thousand words. I even keep a, a notebook with how many words I do a day and that I can, I'll follow, you know, week by week to make sure that I'm staying there. And you have to do that for one thing if you have a deadline, but it just keeps you going and it doesn't make the writing so um, precious and oh you know this is like this little special thing that I have to go to this special special place it's just this is what I do and, and I'm gonna go to that I have to kind of go inside to that place a cut to the bone and get there and, and sit down and do the work and then I have the rest of the day. The interesting thing is writing is, uh, you're, you're isolated as a writer because then you're in the process of writing, you are alone. Mm -hmm. um, you tell a story that I think is really interesting um, where in a way you are back in the clothes of your ancestors, walking kind of as a time traveler in their shoes. You had a concussion, a serious accident and so for a while kind of, uh, vicariously experienced, I guess, in a way, what it was like for these uh, new shoe writers, these, sec these women who wrote secretly to their friends to, to have some contact with the outside world. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, when I was working on Snowflower and the Secret Fan, that really was, I think, one of the hardest things, uh, that, that feeling, uh, trying to get to that feeling of what would it be like to be that isolated. Um, I, I, because I can't imagine it. You know, I just, I'm out and about. I, right now, I've been on an airplane every day for about three months, so I, I you know, I've been really out and about, and, and I, I just can't imagine being so, I just couldn't imagine it. And I, I actually was having a kind of a hard time, and then I had this concussion. I wasn't allowed to drive for six months. I live on the top of a hill, and the next closest thing is about a mile and a half away. It's a gas station. That wasn't going to help me. So all of a sudden, and at least for the first month, I really was in my bedroom because I, I, I was pretty out of it. I had two windows, you know, so I was a little better <laughs> off than the new shoe writers. But, I, but what happened was that these women kind of, and not the usual suspects, not, not the your ones, best friends. not my best friends, but other people 
kind of came out of the woodwork and came and they brought me food and they would come and sit there and talk to me. They would take me out um, for lunch. They would take me to the grocery store. They would take me to, I had so many doctor's appointments and they would, you know, and sitting in the doctor's office and they would sit and wait and wait and they were just, they really were like a sworn sisterhood. So I, first of all, I had that experience of being in a sworn sisterhood, but secondly, I had that experience of being so isolated. And I, I don't recommend that. It's not. It's not like what is it what, that um, actors do the method. You right. Know? Um, <laughs> you don't need to. Have I, I don't want to do that every time I write a book. You know, I don't want to be raped to be able to write a rape scene. But I, I think that that actually what happened there, and being so isolated like that, it did bring me to a place in some funny way, I don't even really know how to describe it, but into this place where I'm still able to go there pretty easily. Um, and that's sort of where I go to start this writing, that I was, I was able to strip away all the usual activity. It sounds so zen. It, it was in a kind of way, and that's a much better word. I'll have to <laughs> use that next time. Well, You've said that when you're in the throes of writing, you don't dream. Mm -hmm. And it's as if you are zoning out in different ways and, and in a way maybe being transported to these yeah. places. Well, I think that that's true. And I've heard that from other writers, too, that when they're writing that they don't dream. Because I think in your daylight hours, you already are in this kind of dream state of going to this, this very imaginative place. And you're, you're kind of touching those very deep emotions and deep relationships that we have. And so by the time it's time to go to bed, it's just, please, just <laughs> turn it off. Just turn it off. <laughs> uh, but that when, when I'm done with the book, oh, I have terrible nightmares. I just have terrible nightmares. And then my husband will say, you need to get started on, on book another again. book. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I've heard that from other writers. And you are writing the sequel to Shanghai mm -hmm. Girls. Um, and I want to talk about that. But before, I want to talk about you as a writer, A, living in L.A., and then as a writer among other uh, Chinese-American writers, uh, Amy Tan, uh, Maxine Hung, Kingston, you've been compared with both mm -hmm. of them. And in fact, you're very good friends with Amy Tan. Very and have good traveled friends. with yes. her Amy to China. Amy and I just were in China last March. Uh, she called me up. She said, you know, she was going to do some research in this one village. Um, she had been invited to stay in a 17th century 29 room bedroom villa in this small village. Did I want to come? And while I was doing research, I needed to go to a villa. I said, sure. <laughs> I mean, I needed research. I needed to go to a village. And I thought, villa, you know, sounds great. I'll just say this. A 17th century villa in China is not the same as a 17th century villa in Tuscany, okay? But it was this incredible trip. And she is such, um, she's a very good friend. You know, she really is like my Laotong. We live in different cities, but we write to each other all the time. And she's very generous. And she, she writes very different kinds of books. And I, I think sometimes, it, and I'll get this criticism sometimes from Chinese readers, Chinese American readers who will say, well, that wasn't like my family. That isn't the experience of my family. Or that, you know, is a different, I don't, I don't understand that. It didn't happen in my family. Well, that's sort of like saying there was one Chinese American experience or one Chinese experience or, and I always answer back, it's like saying there's one American experience. If you just think of movies that are out right now or coming out, you know, would you say if you saw Sex in the City that all American women Who are, are like, single. You know, are like <laughs> right. Carrie or if you saw Precious, all American women are like Precious? Well, there's a pretty big extremes there and, and what writers are trying to do is, is tell a slice of life. Anyway, um, Maxine and Amy and I, we all have the same agent. Oh, interesting. Which is interesting. And, and uh, actually, our agent also has a lot of other Asian American women writers. And so we, we have this kind of nice group. And I think we all, we don't necessarily all see each other, but we all keep in contact. And I'm always interested in what they're working on. And, and I think they're, I hope they're interested in what I'm working on. Now, how do you go to the same 17th century villa and know that you're not going to come back with the same ideas? 
Well, because for one thing, I'm writing about the Great Leap Forward, and she, her story takes place about 200 years ago. So, and I said, you can have, this. the village actually had a very nice name translated into English, Moon Pond Village. And all the sort of history of the village and how, and how the names of all the places, how they all tied in together. I said, Amy, you can have that. You, you just take that. And I'm going to just have, name it something else. But the geography of the place is the same. And we're both using the same. This, I don't know if she's using the villa in her, in her story, but I'm definitely using the villa. And um, she said, oh, we should be very open about it and put it in both of our books that it right. is the same place. And people can see how we do it differently. But I, I don't know. To me, it, it, that do, is, doesn't seem quite as important. Um, Maxine Hong Kingston, um, Warrior Women is the book she's probably, woman warrior. Be, woman warrior, I'm sorry, probably best known for. She has at times been criticized by some Chinese for uh, colluding with uh, racists. You know, that the, her, some people feel that her view of, or the way she writes about the Chinese you know, is I think racist. That, but, uh, you know, that was, that's a kind of a... I think that happened when her book first came out, and it, and it certainly lasted for the next one. Um, that was really one academic uh, and also a writer who really went after her on that on those issues. I I actually think we've kind of gone beyond that place. Uh, I, I mean, I just do. I I think that those arguments don't really exist anymore. It, really, I just I just don't. Um, I'd be interested to talk about, because you write about the, um, the push and pull, number one, to leave a country and go, for instance, to the United States. And so I want to talk about that and also the push and pull that you maybe have felt from your, your uh, different, different ethnic heritage. Mm -hmm. Is that well. something you deal with all the time? Well, yes, but I think I, that was actually something I was talking about earlier of that feeling like I don't completely belong here and I don't completely belong there. Then I think that that's actually made me a better writer because I'm always trying to explain not only to myself but to other people who and what I am and what I know and what I don't know. So in that way, I, I mean, yes, I guess I feel that push and pull and it's very much at the heart of, of these books that I write. That immigrant experience, you know, we all have someone in our family somewhere, maybe not very far back, sometimes it's way back in time, who was brave enough or scared enough or dumb enough to leave their home countries to come here, that they may have been expelled, they may have gone into exile, they may have been taken against their will. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons that people leave their home countries to come here, but we all share in that experience, and so, to me, it, I mean, it's uniquely American. Yes, you could be in China and move to Singapore. Or you could be in, I don't know, Buenos Aires and then move to Lima. Um, but, but we all share in this experience in, in the United States. And so the, the individual stories are different you know, and, and what it was like for Italian Americans or Irish Americans or African Americans. The individual stories are different, but at their heart, they all share in this immigrant experience. And to me, that is so fascinating, but also inspiring at moments and also tragic because, you know, my mom often says, my, my mother's family, they got here in 1610. And she says they, she often says this, they came off the boat, they looked around, they said, where's the bar? <laughs> and, and then that was that, you know, it was downhill after ever since. And so that they, they, instead of kind of going up, they just kept going down. And, and, and that's what's so interesting is everybody is coming in, but, you know, do you rise to the occasion, do you fail? Do you, ha when bad things happen, how do you respond? When good things happen, how do you respond? And so that, I think, again, is just part of this very, very American experience. Tell us what you're working on now. Well, it is the sequel to Shanghai Girls. It picks up right on the same night as uh, Shanghai Girls ends. 
and moves into, uh, they, they are going back to China. Um, it's 1958, and it's really about three or four years, and this is the period of the Great Leap Forward, uh, this moment where all the communes were started, that um, there was this sort of dual project, creating steel, creating an abundance of grain, and yet over 30 million people starved to death. And so it was a very tough time in China. But what inter was interesting to me is that we think of China as being closed, but actually it was very porous. And so a lot of people were going in, a lot of people were coming out. There was a lot of communication between the two countries, even at the diplomatic level. So I'm having a lot of fun with it because it's, again, stuff that people really don't know about. And to try to get to what life was like in a village at that time and what life was like in Shanghai and how some people were really living the high life, multiple servants. The Paris of, of well, Asia. Yes, and, it, and, and the, it wasn't, you know, the, when we think of communist country, people were, it wasn't like that. I mean, yes, for some people it was, but for some people they were living pretty glamorous, fun, interesting lives that had a lot of connections to the outside world. Book club members around the country are waiting with bated breath for, for that story. Thank you so much, Lisa C., for talking with us. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lisa C. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu. You'll also find an excerpt from Lisa C.'s book, Shanghai Girls. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.